Randy wrote a really nice fiction book, but this is far beyond that. <laughs> right. That's true. Yeah. yeah. They put it out and people believe it. Unbelievable. The, the gullibility of people that think that that is actually happening. And that's the same as the unit that they just landed on the moon or claimed they landed on the moon and it fell over. And it's still working. The solar panels that are going to keep it alive, all of that stuff. If you miss a landing on the moon, you lose communication with it and lose it and it's going to crash. You would barely be able to put the pieces back together because this thing is coming in at speed. So, yeah, there's some interesting ideas because if you look at what NASA, you know, the cult leader are telling us, we're supposed to believe it because they say so. But we're now smart enough to be able to say, I don't think so. Because NASA never come up with explanations as to why these things happen. How come the Voyager craft could suddenly communicate? What changed? What was done? They don't tell us that. They just said, oh, we're communicating again. Oh, great. Yeah, bow down in front of it. Yeah, and to claim that it had an alien encounter is just off the wall. Well, it gets eyeballs. That's clickbait. Well, they're taking it from the movie Star Trek. Yeah. <laughs> you know, V'ger. Clickbait in outer space, guys. That's all it is. The only thing they can show us for sure is that they got a rocket that can take off the ground. And its only real purpose is for military. Designed as military weapons. And the only thing they've improved on is the guidance system to operate within the atmosphere. And that's what Musk is showing. He's not showing you anything else other than the fact that he can land his first stage, but that all happens within Earth's atmosphere as a reusable launch vehicle. The payload on top of that that is going off, the second stage that's going off, would be quite practical for military purposes. Yeah, that's what he's doing. He's launching military satellites. Yeah, or they can put an actual weapon on those things, just the same. Anything that happens beyond that in space, I mean, that's when they start with the CGI. Well, CGI's got to come in because it's persuasive. And because you've seen it on television, it must be real. It's the same old story. You know, it worked for Apollo. It's going to work in the future. The idea that putting a nuclear weapon on top of some rocket and firing it off thousands of miles and expecting it to land where it's supposed to land is basically science fiction. It doesn't happen that way. How accurate do you have to get a nuclear weapon to explode? You've got to get it spot on a particular location. Not just a few miles. It's got to be absolutely spot on. And then there's still a percentage of the reaction that happens. As incredible as they are, they've never had a 100% fusion reaction with them. Like what, Hiroshima was, what, 11% or something like that? It's equivalent to 20,000 tons of dynamite. That's what they told us. And it flattened a city. Bloody hell. And, of course, the radioactive signature, if they had a full nuclear reaction, the area would be uninhabitable today. It would, yes. Right? And Hiroshima is built back up as a city. Yeah, so is Nagasaki. Yeah. So what's the problem? How long does the radioactivity last for to affect humans? Maybe a couple of years? Not very long. So uh, except when you get to Chernobyl. Yeah. Whatever it spewed out of there seriously compromised the environment. Well, up to a point, but if you look at what's happened now, if you look at the films of the plants, and specifically the animals, they don't seem to have been affected by it. They're still in there, they're still living, they're still fairly healthy. They haven't all died, they're not all mutating. They're just carrying on with life, because animals don't know they're supposed to be afraid of nuclear weapons. They think, oh good, humans have gone, we can get on with life now, and they've done rather well. So if nuclear radiation which does cause problems, but relatively low-level problems compared to the publicity rounding and the promotion of nuclear weapons as being these devastating, life-ending weapons that we can't possibly use, but we've got to use them as defense. We're not going to use them as defense. We're not going to use them for anything. We're just going to use them for publicity because nuclear weapons don't just go off anywhere. No, they don't. The biggest thing is, is the fear that they put into people. Yeah, that's exactly right. 
a lot of fear generated. And certainly, you know, if you see a city flattened, as we saw with Hiroshima and Nagasaki, a complete city flattened, people will get scared and think, oh, that could happen to me. I better make sure I'm out of the way. Or I better make sure that we never use them. So there's a lot of publicity around the effects that nuclear weapons can have. It doesn't mean to say that it actually is that effect. There's only ever been two nuclear weapons used in anger, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Every other nuclear explosion, there have been several hundred, if not thousands of them, are tests. So they knew where the location of the bomb was. The largest one was set off by Russia, was it not? That's right. And it absolutely scared the hell out of everybody when that one went off. I forget how many hundreds of miles of forest. It was just unbelievable. And that really woke people up. It would take a city out that you wouldn't be able to recognize that there was a city there. The big bomber, I think it was called, was around the time that America was uh, firing nuclear weapons into space to blow a hole in the atmosphere to let the heat out. <laughs> and people believed it. Weren't they also trying to push a hole in the Van Allen belt so they could pass through it with a spacecraft? That's right. They were. Yes. And now we're back to Apollo. Yes. They already had it figured out that they needed to punch a hole in it to get through it. And yet Apollo went through with no big deal. No big deal. No. No effect on the astronauts. No effect on the craft. No radiation damage anywhere. Wonderful. And people believed it because they wanted to believe it. But isn't it extraordinary how Artemis, Apollo's twin sister, the new program to land humans on the moon is having all sorts of problems. But they found out a lot of stuff in 2014 when they launched that, because it literally burned all of the sensors out of that vehicle, except for the battery operated uh, radiation detectors. But they were contained in closets, meter of sand and it filled with water in that. And they only took a snapshot. It's the only reason why they didn't burn out. They just took a snapshot once a minute. And when there's only 15 snapshots, you know that they were only in at the edge of the belt for 15 minutes. Yeah. That whole process was, what, four hours and 24 minutes from launch to splashdown. That's right. Yeah, didn't last very long. Yeah. Didn't go very far. Didn't go as far as the outer belts. And they didn't have to worry about any guidance system because it's just like throwing a baseball up in the air and it just goes up and down in the path. As they knew what they were doing. There's no guidance system, nothing needed to be working. Just it throw it up and it comes back down. And it still had an effect on the heat shield. The, oh, yeah, well, it pretty much destroyed the heat shield. Yeah, it was the Orion craft. That was the first test of the Orion craft, December 2014. And when was the next test following that? About 10 years later? Yeah, I mean, Apollo was start to finish less time than that. Yeah, it was. And they had to put the buildings up. <laughs> yeah, and build everything. Create the equipment to build the rockets, build the launch pads, build everything, and so-called did all the testing. And all that was, was from one test to another test was more than 10 years apart. Extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah, there was a lot of problems. What they realized, there was a lot of problems in 2014. Yeah. Because they decided that in 2014, they thought all they knew about was Apollo. And Apollo had done it, so it was easy to do it with Orion. Trouble is, Apollo hadn't done it. Therefore, finding out on Orion that there were real problems that needed to be overcome, that they weren't even aware of, set them back 10 years. And now you have to consider the fact with Apollo, was there really anybody on board any of those? I don't think so. There's a strong case for saying there was nobody on board. When you take into account the sound level of a Saturn V rocket. It's a good point. If you said to an engineer, we need to insulate the Apollo craft. So you start at 205 decibels. And if you cut that by half and they come back and said that's still too loud. So they cut it by half again. You have reduced the sound volume by 75%. And if you get in that spacecraft, it'll still kill you when you reduce it by 75% because that's still 185 decibels. And people have to realize what the decibel scale is. It's a logarithmic scale. That's right. 
So when you reduce it by 75%, you make it 75% quieter with insulation in that craft. It's still loud enough to liquefy your organs because you are dead at 180 yeah. and it's 185. It's still 50% louder than what it takes to kill you. And if you're sitting on a rocket 360 foot up but the thing takes off, maximum power, you're going to hear it. You're not beyond the sound levels. You're going to well, hear it. they keep it. saying it's behind you, but well, it's not. That, that only applies if you're traveling faster than the speed of sound. So I think it's the Apollo 17 launch that was at night. You can see the sky, the sound waves lighting up the sky around it, right up wrapping over top of it. So it's vibrating the air fast enough that it's causing enough friction in the air molecules to make them light up. Yeah, and that takes quite a lot of power to do that. That's going to create a lot of heat energy into a person's body if you're vibrating their molecules like that, right? And like I said, at a, it's 180,000 cycles per second that that vibration's at. It's just going to be like a ultrasonic cleaner. Yeah, well. And of course, one has to remember that with Apollo, there was this underground shelter that was built and an escape tube for the astronauts, that if there was a problem on the rocket, they could get away from it down this tube into this reinforced bunker underneath the launch site. There's film of people coming down the chute, getting into the bunker. It was equipped for several days of residence. So... I think you're right. There was no astronaut on board the Apollo craft because they didn't dare put somebody on who could have been killed. They'd already experienced this with Apollo 1, where you had three astronauts burnt to death because some idiot didn't know that if you have an electric spark inside a pure oxygen environment, it's going to explode and burn. In normal scientific terms, that's called a calorific bomb. When you consider the amount of time uh, when you see them so-called enter the capsule, there has to be a way out of that to get into the escape chute. That part you never see. No, of course not. Because when they go into that door and it's locked in there, you'd be able to see that part open up. But the escape chute that they had, and then of course they had at least, what, two and a half, three hours before launch. And, and sometimes have- more than that when they're sitting there to get them out of there. And that bunker that they created, of course, was deep enough and reinforced enough that if the entire vehicle blew up on the launch pad, they're not going to be affected by it. And that was the point of it, that it was protected against basically a huge bomb going off just above them. Yeah. And they probably had nice radio thing with their script. Oh, yes. Yeah, when the thing did. took off. One should then compare the fictional film of Capricorn 1 with what would happen if an astronaut was supposed to be dead due to re-entry problems in a Capricorn 1, but wasn't, because he wasn't even on the rocket. That was going to Mars, so it was about 18 months wait. So the astronauts realized that they should be dead, and then they appear at their own funeral, which was great fun. Now, I wonder how accurate that film was in terms of what it was portraying. It was a great chase film. Telly Savalas did very well. O.J. Simpson was in it. You know, there were lots of Hollywood touches to it. But if you look at the real story behind it, or the actual story behind Apollo, but behind Capricorn 1, it was what do you do with an astronaut who is alive, who is meant to be dead? So with Apollo, you couldn't possibly have live astronauts who are meant to be dead because their rocket blew up. Well, then you see, if you didn't actually have the astronauts in the craft, then you don't have to have all of the weight for life support to keep astronauts in that craft. And if you're not going anywhere, you don't have to have all of that fuel, which is the biggest part of the weight on the rocket that they're going to lift. So their tonnage would be about a third of what they were supposed to have in there. And that means you can turn down those Saturn V rockets to make sure that they don't actually blow up down to a safer zone and you still get a decent launch. Yeah, that's right. They'll do that. They needed to guarantee that those rockets got off the ground and got out of sight. Yeah, just out of sight. That's all they had to do. Because once they're out of sight, the script writers would take over. Because they knew what was supposed to happen. They knew all the terms they had to use. 
which is why they used an astronaut as Capcom, capsule communicator, so he could be sure that no mistakes were made. It was very carefully controlled. And if you start looking at it and taking it apart and deconstructing it, you realize that this was all a fabrication. It was not a real rocket launch. It was not astronauts going to the moon. It was script writing. They Story must have written a script for Walter Cronkite as well. Well, Walter Cronkite would be persuaded to go along with it. He was basically on scene, was he not, in a protected bunker? No, he was in a studio, as far as I know. Yeah, but didn't they set one up for him? That one launch where the three buildings, the media buildings, were damaged because of the launch? That's right, there was. He was in one of those at the time. Yeah, I forget which one that was. It probably be six or seven. The launch went off there, but they had media bunkers for them there, so they would be able to control the information going into those so they could report on it. Like when you see Apollo 11, he looks like he's in the CBC studio. Yeah, that's right. So they probably created a link for him directly there because he has to report live. Well, he'd be watching the film that we all were watching with all the props around him, all the uh, landers around him, so he could point to it as if he was knowledgeable about it. CBC already had their animation, would have, which at that time would have taken months yeah. to prepare. And of course, you can't alter that. Like It's like... The animation is already showing the path. Yeah, because that's what the script said was going to happen. So, so they had to have a script follow what that animation was created by, because they can't change it. Yeah. And so there's all your direction, your speed, the whole nine yards is there when the engine turns off, when it shuts off, all done in the animation, and you can't change that. No, no it's got to follow the script, follow the storyboard. Yeah, and when the stages go off and stuff like that, and of course, Apollo 11 did not have a camera mounted on the second stage when the first stage came off. And they showed that separation using a camera that was on a different Apollo mission. Yeah, they did. In fact, that was only discovered quite a lot later when people compared all the film of Apollo. They said yeah. there wasn't a camera showing the separation. So why did they put it in the film? That was supposed to be live. And there they are inserting a previously recorded event. Yeah, because that's what the storyboard said. That's what yeah. the script says should happen. Yeah, it was very well scripted when you really start pulling out the details. Yeah, yeah it would be interesting to know who the script writers were. I think there probably several of them trying to tie the physical events that they knew would take place with the discussion and the dialogue when it happened. That's what happens on feature films. You get dialogue, you get scenes. They would have gotten more views if they had had John Cleese writing it. There you go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the idea that Stanley Kubrick was involved is nonsense. He wasn't involved. He was producing his masterwork, 2001 A Space Odyssey, at the same time. He wouldn't have had time to do it. And anyway, he was working in England. He didn't like flying. Therefore, he wouldn't fly back to America. There's all sorts of little snippets that come out of all these stories that demonstrate how easy it was to create the fiction of Apollo because everybody wanted to believe it was real. Therefore, they overlooked the anomalies. And now, 50 years later, we can see the anomalies and we can put them all together. We come up with a conclusion that the whole thing was fabricated. Well, they're still fabricating it. Yeah, they're still fabricating it because they can't get humans to the moon. They can't be protected. Oh, maybe you can get humans to the moon, but you can't get them back again alive. That's the problem. You'd like you to get them to the moon alive. Well, it'd be nice to be able to do that. We can get unmanned craft to the moon. That's quite easy, because unmanned craft don't require the protection that humans do. We're very delicate little creatures, us humans. We need a lot of protection from what's out in space. Yeah, and it'd be nice if they actually built a craft that had a washroom facility. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, that's like, like Apollo had nothing. Orion program is copying that. There's no washroom on there. Yeah. They're dealing with the same diapers and Texas catheters and everything else on the stuff exactly the same way. Yep, yeah, they are exactly the same way. Unbelievable. Do not have an airlock. Why wouldn't they design one with an airlock? Because you're wasting precious 
environmental life support systems when you just open the door and all of the air goes out. You are. So you've got to carry more consumables to keep humans alive. It'd be much easier to build a little airlock so you could get out that way. Right. And then, of course, they're going to go to the moon and go in and out and in and out and in and out. How many times can you do that? How much oxygen do you need to take with you? No, they found oxygen on the moon. They found water. Isn't that convenient? So they can electrolyze it and get oxygen and hydrogen. They could stop at the Apollo 17 landing site and maybe suck the water out of that flag. <laughs> <laughs> well, they wouldn't dare do that now, would they? Because it would um, expose the whole fiction. Yeah, they'd have to stop by Flagstaff to do that. Well, they could practice at Flagstaff. They've got a real Sea of Tranquility site created so they could practice on it. So go back and practice on that. They still have most of that set up, don't they? Yeah, they do. It's still, there's been some of it's a bit overgrown. There have been a few trees there. They have to get rid of those. But yeah, the actual craters are still there. A bit part worn by all the off-road drivers who are having a bit of fun around there. The U.S. is pretty good at defoliation. They were doing that in the Vietnam War, were they not? The defoliate a forest in a heartbeat. Yeah, Agent Orange, that was. Yeah. Yeah, that was very helpful. That was. God. That was going on at the same time as Apollo, the Vietnam War. Well, that's the other part of the story. They had so many problems within the country that they needed a distraction. They needed a program that was large enough that unified the people in a single project to help bring the country back together. Yeah. So you get Operation Mockingbird yeah. to make sure that agents are planted in newsrooms print newsrooms, television newsrooms, to make sure the story is correct. Well, and they still do that today too, don't they? Oh, they do, yeah, yeah. You see it all the time, same sort of thing. When something comes along which uh, hasn't been answered properly, like where did that virus come from? How did it get around the world? You see the film of the hospitals in northern Italy being overwhelmed. You think, oh, God, that's going to happen to us. But, and when you know why it happened, it's much less frightening. So all these things start to get explained and they start to add up after a while. Same thing with Apollo. It'll be the little things that take it out. The overlooked factors involved. You know, the idea that humans need much more protection than they were given on Apollo because what will take humans out is radiation. They weren't protected from it. When you think about how little they actually knew and the fact that they were even quarantined, afterwards i mean it's all fantasy but they had that as part of the project right? yeah, it was all part of the story was, on the first one and then these guys it's like well we can't keep them in quarantine the media wants them so right? let them out. yeah we just skip that part of the program because let's get them straight to the media and of course by the time they got to apollo 16 everybody's watching reruns of i love lucy or they're watching mash or whatever else was on TV, and it didn't matter how they timed it. Everything was always timed so they hit the 11 o'clock news. Of course they did. It's part of the publicity stunts. They pulled them all. I mean, the landing of Apollo 11 was specifically timed to feature on the 9 o'clock news. Extraordinary. How did they know? How did they get it so accurate? No, they didn't get it accurate. They planned it well in advance. They knew they were going to do it for the 9 o'clock news. So they did. Well, I That's think when the Apollo 11 stepped out, just after the first commercial break, Eastern Standard Time, uh, you know, so it's 11.15 or 11.16, right? Neil steps on the ground, right? They get the news on and they're building up to it. Yeah, they're building up to it. And they so make sure everybody's in front of the TV. And now he's going to step out and do the first step. Beautifully timed. Yeah, it was. Beautiful. And it's not by chance. Nothing was left to chance. It was all carefully planned in advance using an IBM 360 computer that's just been developed. It was being used by news stations for programming. It's clever. It all came together. It's interesting. Somebody's found a copy of the, I think it's NBC coverage of the landing, of the actual Apollo 11 landing from the time it happened, which was what, July 20th, 1969. It's quite clear. Well, as far as it ever would be clear, given what it was being filmed by, 
another TV camera. And if you look at it and you see the astronaut moving from the shadow of the lander, and that would be Armstrong, to take up his position to photograph Buzz Aldrin coming down the ladder. And you look at Buzz Aldrin as he comes down the ladder. And if you remember the pictures, they all show him brilliantly illuminated by the reflective surface of the moon, we're told. No, he wasn't. In the film, he's just a shadow. Now, if he was being lit up like a Christmas tree, as we see in the photographs, that would be evident from the film. It's not. He's in darkness. You don't see, you see an outline of presumably old Aldrin coming down the ladder. You see Armstrong standing in the sun photographing him, but you don't see any reflection on Aldrin of this bright sunlight that we see in the photographs. So the photographs in the film don't match. That must mean that they did a retake on that. He must have come down that ladder at least a half a dozen times. Oh yeah, at least, probably more than that. Because when you look at what NASA claims is the original footage off the same TV camera that they only had one, Neil's not even in position to take the photographs when he's coming down. No, he's not. So then you've got another one that says he's in position taking photographs when he's coming down. And then you got the photographs where he's perfectly lit up. So that's three events, three separate events. Yeah, it's a storyboard. It's a creation to show what would happen if somebody landed on the moon and came down the ladder. And it was a very well constructed storyboard because it tells the story. You don't even need captions. You know what you're looking at. The problem is it couldn't possibly have happened. Not the way we're shown. There isn't enough light to show up as the photographs demonstrate. You see that we've talked about them redressing the set and redoing it. I mean, it, it's in the cue cards, Apollo 12 cue cards, yeah. where they, the Snoopy's looking out there and going, oh, look, there's footprints everywhere. And he's going to come down the ladder one more time. they got to clean them all up before he can come down <laughs> the next time, right? <laughs> That's in the cue cards. They're making jokes about that. You take a look at Apollo 12, you see a guy that has just come down the ladder and there's dirt on the legs of his suit. He hasn't touched the ground yet yeah. and he's got dust on him. That was from an earlier shot that didn't work. Right. And it's like, go up and let's do it again. And of course, we know that the lamb itself and all of those are just simply a mock-up. No equipment inside. I mean, how do you forget to put a door handle on the damn door? <laughs> how? Because you don't think anybody's going to spot it. And 50 years okay. later, we've spotted it. They can't jump out of those spacesuits really quick. But when they need to take a break, you know, with all that studio lighting on, they take their helmet off, which is very heavily shielded. It's going to bother their eyes. So they had to put a sunglass pocket on. Yeah. <laughs> right? For the sunglasses to go after they take their helmet off. Right? Because they're using very powerful lights, probably at Cannon Air Force Base, where they did the rehearsals. Yeah, they would have done it many, many times. Yeah, about a hundred times. Because coming down that ladder, if you actually look at the ladder on the lander, it's actually quite dangerous. Because on the top rung, which you can't see when you're coming off the porch area, the top rung has got a major obstruction on it, which is what ties it to the leg. So you've got to get your feet in exactly the right place, either side of this obstruction. Now, if you don't do that properly, if you don't get it right, you're going to fall off. End of story. So they practiced it many yeah. times. Well, I think when they designed the ladder itself, they just had a guy walking up and down it with a pair of shoes on or something, and then they put those big boots on. You can barely get your feet in on the rung when it's sitting there and of course you've got the leg is in the center of it so you've only got a very small space on each side they could have made it wider they just made it a standard width like a step ladder with an eight inch step in it and then they stuck a leg on the middle of it and that's about it they didn't really think that one through yeah there are several things like that which occur the fact that the ladder would have been very dangerous to walk down because you couldn't see it if you're wearing a spacesuit and a helmet which they had to wear a helmet, you couldn't see where to put your feet. And then the other thing is, is the leg is supposed to compress just by the weight of the machine about 11 inches. So you take a, a ladder that's what, 30, 32 inches off the ground as the bottom rung, 
and it comes down 11 inches. Now it's 21 inches off the ground. And when you're supposed to have some G-force on it, it's supposed to bring it down even farther. So it's going to be maybe 15 or 16 inches off the ground. But the model they made, they didn't alter that. So it's still the 32 inches. They because forgot. those legs on that model don't compress. No. Another anomaly, another mistake that they made. That they made.